East 9 Monstrum Nox is the 10th canonical entry in Neil Falcom's long-running East franchise, first appearing in 1987 with the release of East 1 Ancient East Vanished, the series would continue to pump out entry after entry, continuing to have a fan base there to support it through the thick and thin. Falcom has not always had great success with the East franchise. It's had many ups and downs, and it's taken Falcom a long time to finally figure out things that work. But with the revival of E6 Ark of Nepishtim, East was finally able to find its niche within the market, and it's only continued to grow since then. East 8 brought in a bunch of brand new fans into the franchise and put a lot of new eyes upon the series as a whole. No doubt East 9 was going to have a lot to live up to. There's definitely a lot of hype surrounding this game and expectations that it needs to deliver. So is East 9 a game that is worth playing? Is it a game that if you're looking to get into the franchise, you can pick up and play right now? We're going to answer these questions and more in this review. NIS America was kind enough to send me a review copy of the game and I'm excited to share my thoughts and my feelings about the game. So sit back, relax, subscribe to the channel, and let's find out as we review East 9 Monstrum Nox. East 9 is the game to take place the furthest on the timeline, taking place after the events of East 7, the events that happened in Altago. If you're wondering, can you pick up East 9 without playing any of the other entries? The simple answer to that question is yes, but if you want a breakdown of the entire timeline and the differences between each versions of the game, you can check out this video right here detailing all of that information. Let's not waste any more of your time and dive right into the story and the character section of our review. Adol and Dogi arrive outside of the city of Balduk, but before they can even enter the city, Adol is detained and taken to Balduk prison. What Adol did exactly is unclear, but the Roman Empire seems very suspicious of him because of his knack for always getting into trouble, as word has really started to travel far and wide of Adol's many adventures. East 9 instantly sets up the mystery that sucks you right into the game's plot. With the help of a fellow inmate, Adol escapes a cell and makes a break to the exit. Upon leaving, Adol meets a mysterious cloaked woman named Aprilis. What she is and her purpose are unknown but she picks Adol to become a monstrum and gives him the name the Crimson King. Adol, with his newfound powers, escapes the guards but is caught by more. He makes a plunge into the aqueducts and washes up outside of the city. Word of the monstrum has started to spread and they have a reputation around the city. Many city folk are afraid of them and who they are. Monstrums are free to run amok the city, but when the time comes, they are summoned to Grimwald Knox, an alternate world stuck in a blood-red night, where creatures known as Lemuries infest. Adol and the other monstrums must work together to defeat the Lemuries. The city also has people randomly being arrested and thrown in prison for no apparent reason. Balduk is known for being a prison city and hosting a giant prison, called Balduk Prison. The prison used to be a fortress back in the day of the 100 Years Wars and holds many secrets. The big question the plot will need to answer before the game's end is what is Grimwald Knox? What is going on in the prison? Who are the Monstrums? What role does Adol play in all this? And what is behind the mysterious things happening around the town? Something I failed to mention in my previous reviews is how all the East games are inspired by real world empires and places. If the continent of Africa and the Roman Empire didn't give that away already. It is also clear it is inspired by real world mythology. What I found cool was the mention of the 100 years war actually being a thing in the game's history. Being a major history buff myself, this got me all kinds of excited. There are also plenty of easter eggs to characters, locations, and Adol's previous adventures for those who were already invested into the series. These alone will make newcomers to the series curious about the other games, so if you want a breakdown of the timeline, you can check it out in the card above. 
I just hope Falcom keeps it a little easter egg and doesn't try to connect them to the game's plot too heavily from game to game. I like the adventures being an isolated event. It definitely can be enjoyed as a first entry, but it really also does serve as a giant love letter to the entire series. And the ending was fantastic as well. It all came together with a nice ribbon on top tying everything together as things eventually did start to fall into place and make a lot more sense as to what was going on, serving a nice big conclusion to those questions that I said that would be answered throughout the game's progression. The characters are an interesting bunch and it's hard to talk about them without diving too much into spoiler territory, but the interaction and character moments from East 8 are all there. The game focuses a lot harder on its main characters this time around and building them up than any other entry. Each character has a motivation that propels their action and causes for reasons they act the way that they do. The side characters were good, but I didn't love them as much as I did in Ease 8. That's to be expected though because it's more focused on your main cast and emphasis on story this time around rather than focusing so much on all of these characters just trying to survive. I still found my time spent with these characters well worth my time though. If you've played any of the previous party based East games then you know at this point what to expect. But if you're new to the series or are looking to get into it then let me explain. East 9 is an action RPG much akin to that of Tales or Star Ocean. But unlike those games battles take place in the same field instead of transitioning to a separate battlefield. You'll be able to have three members in your active party at any given time. Each member of your party will come equipped with one of three types of attacks. Strike, Slash, and Pierce. Depending on the enemy, they may be weak to a certain type of attack. Shelled enemies are going to be weak against Strike, Jelly or Soft enemies are going to be weak against Slash, and Fly enemies are going to be weak against Pierce. Utilizing these to your advantage will build up the enemy's break gauge. Once the break gauge is full, you'll be able to stun enemies allowing you to go in and do moderate damage to them. You're going to be switching between party members a lot to deal different types of damage to different enemies. By using the shoulder buttons in combination with X, square, circle, or triangle, you'll be able to use skills not only to do more damage to them, but your basic attacks will also increase your special meter. You can use your special by pressing down R1 and L1 at the same time. Unlike other East games though, your special meter plays out a bit differently. Once activated, it will start to decrease, allowing for attacks to become stronger and your skills to become stronger as well. By pressing R1 and L1 again, you will activate your special moves for a decent amount of damage. This meter seems to fill up a lot quicker than it did in previous games too. Something else to make a return are flash move and flash guard. By using L1, you'll be able to roll out of the enemy's way, timing it just right will give you a flash move. By pressing R1 at the right time, you will execute a flash guard. A flash guard will give you a moment of invulnerability by blocking all enemy attacks while letting you go in and continuously attack an enemy. Some other small changes to the battle system is being able to use monstrum abilities during battle. We will speak more about this in depth of each of these when we get to the exploration section of our gameplay. Let's discuss a few of the perks that come from using Monstrum Powers in battle. For Adol's Crimson Line, which will let you close the gap between you and your enemy, and Doll's Third Eye, which will let you see the enemy's weakness during battle. Raging Bull's ability will break the enemy's defense in battle. So if there is a shield that an enemy is carrying, there is a possibility it may break that shield. It will also increase their break gauge a lot faster. Renegade's ability will allow you to disappear into the ground, hitting your enemies. The least useless in battle are White Cat's and Hawk's abilities, allowing you to fly or climb up walls. They may come in handy when you're exploring around the city, but they have no real benefit to battle. Grimwald Knox battles will be very familiar to those who have played East 8. They function much the same way that raids or hunts did in that game. The combat plays out normally, but with a few different things added. There are two types of Grimwald Knox battles we need to discuss. 
Sieges play out more like a tower defense game. You'll engage in regular combat against the Lemuries, and your goal is to protect the Sven from taking damage. You'll also have pentacles, which will inflict damage and certain status elements to your enemies, decoys, which will distract the enemies towards them, taking damage you would receive or the Sven would receive, Lux cannons shoot out stun flares, stunning your enemies, and musketeers shoot out gravity orbs, causing ranged damage. Dogi and your non-party characters will also participate in Grimwald Nox battles. They each have their own abilities they bring to battle. You'll have a meter showing how well you're doing. The damage done to you and the Sven and how well you do in battle will be determined in your ranking at the end. Purges play out differently in that you have to destroy the enemy crystals scattered across the battlefield in order to seize victory. These are located in various different places across the battlefield. Though easy at first, some will eventually become much harder and you will need to use Dahl's third eye in order to see all the crystals. You'll also have to contend with a time limit, keeping the timer above 3 minutes will almost always ensure you get an S ranking. For the bulk of the game, you will be stuck exploring the streets of Balduk, finding treasure chests, collecting azure petals, discovering landmarks, and finding graffiti written on the wall. Access to certain areas of the city will be blocked until you unlock them during story progression. Over the course of the story, the other monstrums will join your party and you'll be able to use the powers that they have no matter who you are playing as. Adol will be able to zip onto designated ledges, White Cat will be able to run up walls, Hawk will be able to glide, Doll will be able to reveal secrets and single things out as well as being able to see through walls, Raging Bull will be able to break down broken walls, Renegade Renegade will be able to use what is called Shadow Dive and get into small openings or sneak in and grab treasure chests that are being guarded. You'll also be able to explore runes and fills, albeit very minimum. There will be segments where Adol is playable in the prison. During these segments, you will have to explore and gain intel. You will not be able to use your monster and powers during this investigation. The map took a step back for me. Something I really enjoyed about East 8 was getting a chance to see the map take up the left side of the screen. It seemed it went back to just being a small square off to the left side and pulling up the full map to see where your destination is. I loved not being able to have to pull up the map every time in order to see where I was going. I wanted to see a bigger version of it. It's not a deal breaker, but it was something very much missed. Landmarks, shops, quest markers, treasure chests, graffiti spots, Grimwald Knox entrances, and story destinations will also be marked on the map. Side quests make a return this time around, and it's a bit of a mixed bag for me this time. First off, there are two types of ways you can discover side quests. Some will be submitted to the bar and posted via the bulletin board. Other side quests you'll have to find and initiate, which are indicated by markers on your map. They are marked on the map so you know they exist, but they don't appear on the board. Not sure why they did this, but it seems a bit counterintuitive if you ask me. Side quests play a major role into side stories, world building, and oftentimes intertwine with the plot. If you want the full context of the story or a bit more depth to the world and the events transpiring, it's going to be in your best interest to do them all, though it is not required. You'll also pretty much be forced to do side quests this time around to increase your Nox, which will open up the next portal to Grimwald Nox so you can take down the barrier blocking your way to progress the story. This becomes repetitive very fast. In East 8, there were side quests after all, and you'd oftentimes be heading in that way to progress the story making them feel like they were optional, but not out of your way to do them. East 9 is pretty much complete the side quest, slay a Lemurie or two to get the extra little bit of Nox you need to open the Grimwald Nox, complete it, open the barrier, and progress the story. Its rinse and repeat cycle becomes quite grindy after a while. Character gifts make a return, as do bonding events, and these serve as ways to get to know the characters a little bit better. Though as of the making of this review, I didn't do all of the bonding events, but I I do plan on going back and finishing them out. While I enjoyed the extra story and world building the side quests have, I wasn't a fan of how repetitive it became. Despite my annoyance with how the game handled its side quest in terms of progression, the side quests themselves were more than satisfactory. They were more than just a random fetch quest or go slay this monster quest. They added to the game's world, whether it be through expanding on smaller details introduced within the game's plot or using them to flesh 
flesh out a character's backstory or just using them to build the world showing the tension between Glia and the Roman Empire. Developers, pay attention, because Falcom has just fixed a problem that has plagued the video game industry for over a decade. Side quests shouldn't feel like giant time wasters just so you can advertise 60 plus hours on the back of your box. There is a way to make a game feel like it's worth the player's money without wasting the player's time. I'd rather have a game that had fewer side quests expanding on the world than have a hundred plus side quests that feel meaningless and are just time wasters. A bit of critique to Falcom though, don't force your side quest through story progression. If your player is invested in your plot, characters, and world, they will naturally progress to doing your side quests anyway. If your player only cares about the game in the context of its narrative, you're only going to alienate those players from playing your game by forcing them to do side quests. Healing is done specifically through food. You'll have food that heals a good chunk of HP and then you'll have ingredients to cook and you'll also be able to forge weapons, sacramentals, and accessories. Sacramentals are items that give you added benefits. One such sacramental will allow you to stand in one spot and continually gain HP back. The soundtrack is stellar as usual. It took some time to grow on me. It has a lot of softer tones adding to the game's atmosphere. It's kind of like E6. It's not typically your normal E soundtrack, but it starts to grow on you the more you listen to it. There were some dropped frame rates, some objects loading in slowly or just seemingly appearing out of nowhere, but it wasn't a huge deal breaker for me. Normal is way too easy. Easy enough you can pretty much hack and slash your way through most of the game without much trouble. Do yourself a favor and turn the difficulty up to at least hard. I stuck with normal to see if the game got any harder later on and it didn't. Those about sum up the smaller complaints I had with the game though. I enjoyed my time with East 9. Its story and characters kept me more than intrigued and pressing onward despite the formulaic repetitive structure the game went with. I'll give East 9 my gaming with spoon seal of approval because fans of the series will no doubt have a good time with it despite its flaws and there is enough great content to keep newcomers satisfied. I still think East 8 is a better game and a better place to start, but that's just because I think it's a more solid all-around experience. That is going to conclude my East review. If you liked what you saw or found it helpful, consider giving the video a like and sharing it on social media. Not only does that help me out, but it also spreads awareness about this wonderful series that I absolutely enjoy. That being said, if you are looking for more information about the East series or you want to continue your adventures with Adol after you start, you can check up that timeline video I've mentioned at the beginning of my review, or you guys can also head over to Digital Emless. I will leave a link down below in the description so you guys can check them out. Digital Emless is a great website compiling a lot of information about East regarding the combat through the various different games the timeline placement, and just a whole bunch of other information, and I recommend checking them out. They were a huge asset to me when I first started taking a look into the East franchise, and honestly, all the information I got from them was absolutely helpful. So link down below in the description to them. The next review on the channel is going to be Legend of Ligaya. I initially wanted to get this out first, but East 9 happened, and... Well, here we are with the review for that. So, Legend of Lagaya is going to be coming up next on the channel. That is the next game we are going to tackle. I want to try to get that out mid-late February, kind of depending on what's going on. Uh, it should be sooner rather than later. We are uh, it's about halfway through the game now. So, yeah, looking forward to that. If you want to check out that review, be sure to hit subscribe, ring the bell notification so you don't miss that when it goes live, along with any other video that we decide to upload to the channel. And most importantly, guys, stay happy, be happy, game happy. Spoons is checking out.